thank you to Kurt and Elizabeth and um, the audience as well for inviting me to come and talk about the Missouri State Archives uh, this evening. I'm excited to do this, um, but uh, I have to put a little caveat there. Um, I've been an administrator for 14 years now. I worked in the Memphis Public Library in Tennessee um, and the Memphis Shelby County Archives there. Um, so they don't let me come and reference all the time, but I'm thrilled whenever I have the opportunity uh, to talk to folks about the genealogical resources that we have here at the Missouri State Archives. Uh, hopefully, uh, those of you that have the handout can use that um, effectively. But I want to talk, the theme of tonight, or the, or the hook of tonight, I guess, is that Missouri is always referred to um, as the gateway to the West. And if you don't know why it's referred to as the gateway to the West, you have to think about the rivers, um, and the railroads and the trails that came through Missouri and um, that run through Missouri and that and that started in Missouri. And most of the time people think about the Ohio, Missouri, uh, muddy Missouri, the mighty Mississippi, um, and then followed those by all the different trails that come through uh, with the Oregon Trail and the 49ers and the Mormons, the Santa Fe Trail, um, uh, the, you know, all the different trails out west mostly were connected to uh, Missouri. Um, but I want to kick off tonight by telling you a little bit about a, a trail you probably have never heard of, and that's the Boonswick Trail. Uh, it was really our first gateway to the West, uh, the fastest growing county uh, in, in the United States in the 1820 census was Howard County, Missouri. It was faster growing than any eastern county, um, and it was the terminus of what was called the Boonswick Trail at the time. And that was the furthest west you could go in the United States. And you had settlers just pouring into Missouri in the late 18 teens uh, because of the Boonslick Trail. And, and really that gateway to the west starts there, but continues after that. And you have this flood of immigrants at the time, and it continues to ebb and flow um, as settlers move through Missouri and keep moving west. Uh, most of you may not recognize this image, but we'll recognize this as the St. Louis Arch. And the St. Louis Arch was actually built as a symbol of movement uh, for Western expansion. Um, it's called the Jefferson Westward Expansion by some people, um, uh, National Monument. So, um, but I also think that this image is a really good philosophical illustration about uh, many of our genealogical, uh, the, the genealogical research of many uh, of us, because it really shows a work in progress um, that, you know, the arch is finished and has been for a long time, but our genealogy really never will be. And there's, there's always going to be weak links and missing parts. I think that it's, like I said, a really good example how um, that our genealogy research goes. In some ways, it's just an outline uh, of, um, of our ancestors' lives. That's what our genealogy is. And we can still add history and context and other sources uh, to that. So tonight I'm hoping that I'm gonna be able to, for those of you that have Missouri wines, and most of you probably do, uh, if, you if you look at enough of your ancestors uh, and enough of your lines, you're gonna find Missouri ancestors there. But hopefully I wanna talk to you about um, the sources that are available here at the Missouri State Archives give you a little bit of history. We were officially created in 1965, uh, but technically the Secretary of State's office has always been the official repository for state records from the creation of the state to the present time. Uh, we did have a couple of capital fires. So there were a lot of records that were lost um, here in Missouri, but we still have records that date back. Uh, to the French and Spanish territorial period. And we also, because we um, have three different roles that we play, so the State Archives includes the Records Management Division uh, for the State, State Archives itself, and the local records. Uh, we collect records not only for state government, but also county and municipal government records here as well. Um, so we have a vast collection um, of records that we try and make available Originally on microfilm, but we're digitizing and indexing and putting more and more of that uh, online each day, each year. Um, so I want to talk about two portions of our website is the focus of my talk tonight, though. And the first of those is Missouri Digital Heritage. Uh, Missouri Digital Heritage is a collaborative work between the Missouri State Library and the State Archives. 
We have over 500 collections of material from libraries and museums, uh, archives all across the state. Um, I think that number is wrong on this slide. I think it's over 100 um, different institutions now that have materials accessible through Missouri Digital Heritage. Not all of these collections um, are specifically genealogical collections, but as you do genealogical research, you're going to find that many of the historical sources you can use for genealogical research. Um, and so uh, I would encourage you uh, to look at some of these sources that I'm going to highlight tonight, but also look beyond those on the website as well. The uh, Missouri Digital Heritage site does host some of the ARCA's own collections, uh, particularly photograph collections. We've got hundreds of thousands of photographs available online uh, for you to look at, and also state publications that are useful like the official manuals, or a lot of people call them the blue books, um, where you can look up state employees each year all the way back um, to the early 1900s, um, and those kind of things, and all kinds of other state publications that you can go and look at um, the government documents um, that we publish on Missouri Digital Heritage. I won't talk about it tonight, uh, but the State Historical Society of Missouri uh, has a tremendous number of newspapers available uh, on that website as well. Um, so it's a good resource, especially for the early small town newspapers. They have it sold to newspapers.com. That, um, that they have a partnership with newspapers.com to do some of those bigger titles. Um, they've put a lot of the smaller titles with funding through the State Library uh, on this website as well. And then there's a, a couple of three items um, at the end that I'm going to highlight that were done by the University of Missouri uh, that are particularly, in my opinion, uh, valuable resources for doing genealogy research as well. This is the Missouri Digital Heritage website. Um, and I hope that you can all see the little uh, Ghostbusters symbol on each of those um, to where that I will I will say that there's so much material here. It's like drinking out of a fire hose. Um, so unless you have a very unique name that you're searching for, um, like a, one of the examples I'm using uh, tonight um, is uh, an Indianan with a last name of Zero, Z-E-R-O-W. That might actually work in the basic search. But unless you have a really, really unique name, I would not use the basic search at the top or on the page. I would not use the advanced search uh, at the top or uh, embedded on the page uh, because you're going to get back more results um, than it, it limits to a thousand results. You're going to get more results back then you can actually look through. Um, so the best way to search this page um, is actually to browse first. Uh, the, I think it's the third tab, so it'll be home, civil war that's covered up with that red arrow and browse collections. You wanna click on that pull down there and search by a couple of different ways is the most useful. If you're using photographs, you might use the media tab but more than like, and if you want to just look and see all the 500 collections out there, you can do the view all. But the main way that I would recommend for genealogy you do this is to click on the view topic. Or if you have a particular institution, like you know you want to do newspapers, you would go want to go to by institution and look at the State Historical Society. Although there's actually three or four collections of newspapers that aren't theirs on this website too. So even then it wouldn't work. But if you click um, on the uh, tab by topic, it brings up this list. This is just the top portion of it. And you can select genealogy uh, from that list. So this will give you all of the different collections that we have on Missouri Digital Heritage that deal with genealogy. Um, it's a very long list. This is just a couple of things that I have um, listed here to kind of show some of the diversity of things that we have on, on the website from our collection. So these are just uh, collections from us. But for instance, the Missouri Annual Reports of Public Schools. If you click view collection on this collection, you would be able to go and look at lists of teachers. It says 1858 to present. It's actually best um, up through the 20s, the 1920s and 30s. They stopped listing the teachers names after that. But there's a valuable resource for someone if they were an administrator or a teacher um, at a school. You can go view the collection and actually even search the collection. I'll show you how to do that on a different collection. Or you can go to our Bicentennial Photograph Drive. If any of you have Missouri ancestors and you have photographs from Missouri, this is an active program that we have right now, encouraging people to actually submit digital images 
uh, that we can use to commemorate the state's 200 years of uh, since statehood. Um, so you can click on view collection and it will not only um, show you a link there on how to submit, uh, but it also shows you all the photographs that have already been submitted. But I have this screen up because I want to show you um, this is where you want to go to where you can actually do a much better search. So if you click browse at the bottom of any of these collections and they're called splash pages. So you browse to the subject of genealogy, you browse to a collection that you want uh, to look at, you browse in that collection, then you're able to get to the actual fully granulated search screen. Okay, and this allows you to search across all collections, or I would say where that first red arrow is, you actually deselect select all collections, and then you select, you click show all, and then you select the collection or collections that you actually want to search uh, by. Um, and that way you can look um, at hopefully all of the results that relate to your search in each of these, instead of the system limiting you to 999. Uh, results. And 999 is a lot to look through, but it, on most searches, like if you were doing even John Dugan or Dugan as a last name, uh, you may only get through the A's and the B's and never get to John Dugan uh, with the search results because of the millions of records that are on this page. Um, so it's a lot to tell you, but this is the secret in the sauce of how to do a really in-depth search of the Missouri Digital Heritage uh, portion of our website. Um, so, um, and hopefully you can go back and refer to these notes and it will remind you of how uh, to do that. So I'm going to give a couple of examples that I think are extremely useful for doing genealogical research with the Missouri Digital Heritage portion of our website. And the first of those is, I'm, whenever I was working in Tennessee, we call them the Goodspeeds histories. Um, they're actually, uh, in Missouri, there are very few of them published by Goods, but they're that same mid, late, 19th century, early 20th century, um, what I call vanity histories that have um, historical overviews of the county government and all the cities, as well as submitted biographical sketches um, for a lot of the residents who pay to have their biographies uh, put in those bo books in, in most instances. Um, and they have lots of, what I have here on the slide is embellished stories and interesting tidbits. Uh, normally, there's a crime section in each of them um, that has some of the most notorious crimes up until that time period for the county, but just a lot of really good information. So you've browsed to the collection. You're going to go here, and I'm going to select Jackson County as my example. So I'm going to click that. I'm going to select Jackson County. I'm going to select a book, and I didn't show you a slide for that, but I select a book, um, a specific book in Jackson County. And so up here in the top right, it allows you to search this record, and I should have replaced Jackson County uh, with something else there, but I show you in the red down, read it out zoomed in area. That is where you actually would type in, if you're going to search my last name, Dugan, and it will show you the number of results in that book. So as opposed to Jackson County appearing in this book 5,398 times, hopefully there will only be a dozen or 20 or 50 Ent entries in here, and you can go to each of those pages and look exactly at what you want. As with anything that's um, OCR uh, that uses optical character recognition, you want to play around with it a little bit and just make sure that you don't miss anything. Um, so if there are typical misspellings, use those at this point as well. Uh, but that allows you to fairly quickly mine all the information in an individual volume. You can do this at the collection level as well, um, but it's much better to do it at the individual volume level um, because of the vastness of this collection um, or, the, or, or the Missouri Digital Heritage website. Um, so the county histories are really useful, um, something that I think um, that um, you probably have used in the past, but if you haven't, in the locations of the locations that you are doing research, I would encourage you to use those county histories. Also on um, this page, we actually have two or three different sets, uh, but we have a primary set and some uh, supplemental sets of county plat books. Um, these also came in wall maps as well, but we don't have any of the wall maps from our collection integrated into this at this time. But we've taken a lot of effort and time and taken 141 of those volumes 
and not only digitized those, but indexed every name of every individual uh, in those volumes from the maps uh, to where that you can find them in these books. Um, the difficulty about that is once you get to the page, you're going to have to know how to read rain section and townships a little bit on some of these uh, to be able to find them. Or sometimes you're going to find that in this example, you know, that the Tysons maybe owned several different tra tracts of land. Um, so you're going to have to look throughout the page and find all of the different instances uh, where that they lived um, and that location. So another kind of caveat on this is if the map was published um, about the time that your ancestor um, moved to that county, um, they normally, the data is a couple years old on these. This is a generalization for them nationwide. So if they don't appear and you think your ancestor bought their farm, you've got documentation they bought their farm there, that may be because there's a slight lag between the copyright date on these books and the time that the information was actually gathered to create um, the, the books. But um, the search works the same way as the county histories. I won't go um, into that again, but another great resource that we have on Missouri Digital Heritage. Um, so I'm going to wrap up talking about Missouri Digital Heritage by saying there's, there's hundreds of collections out there that are useful for you. Um, there's St. Louis City directories. Um, there's the Sanford Fire Insurance maps um, and the uh, Whipple maps for St. Louis um, that show every single block of the city that was under the fire protection districts of those cities. All the small towns had these as well. They're great because they're almost like an aerial uh, photograph of uh, the, the buildings. The pink buildings are brick buildings. The yellow buildings are wooden buildings. The porches are shown, how many stories are shown, how many stove flues in each of the buildings are shown. So you know that they had a fireplace and a wood cook stove. Um, they're just really, really interesting. They also will help you identify photographs, family photographs and those kind of things in an urban setting. So I'd encourage you to use the Missouri um, fire insurance maps on this page. There are a lot of small collections that I would call vertical file collections. And good examples of those are some from the library at the Springfield uh, Green County Public Library. Um, where they have uh, put up uh, Black Family Histories of the Ozarks. Um, they have their Green County files there as well, um, and a lot of other material there as well. Springfield is, a, is well represented uh, in these collections. Um, and then you have smaller collections like the Palmyra uh, Funeral Home Registers from Sprague Funeral Home, um, and there's some other funeral homes that are represented as well. Um, Hannibal has put up several collections, including a pretty extensive set of their city directories. Uh, so if you're doing research in Hannibal um, in the period from the Civil War up through the 1920s, um, they have a really good collection of those there. So anyway, so that's the Missouri Digital Heritage portion of our website. It may look on a lot of these other pages like you're on Missouri Digital Heritage, but the archives databases one other thing um, the staff recommended that I uh, make sure and point out here. So many of these collections are not owned by the Missouri State Archives. They are not owned by the Missouri State Library. And so at the very bottom of every page is an is a, is a entry that says copy request. And this is who you contact and how you contact them. If you need a high resolution image or you want to use these for publication, you can call or email them and be able to uh, get that information uh, from them. Probably every week, maybe even every day, uh, we get asked, can I use this image in, uh, you know, in, a, in a genealogy presentation? Can I use this image? And most of the time we actually refer them on to another institution. You can do that yourself by just scrolling to the bottom um, if you need to know that. So now back to the Missouri Digital Heritage or away from Missouri Digital Heritage to the Missouri State Archives uh, databases. They're skinned to look like Missouri Digital Heritage, but these are each individual distinct um, databases that you use to um, do very extensive research. Most of these do have a genealogical focus or a significant genealogical element in them. Uh, there are a few that I won't give examples of just for the sake of time tonight. Um, you all probably, if you come to a lot of these programs, um, have had uh, programs on coroner inquests and naturalizations. 
Um, you may not have on civil provost marshals, and hopefully you've had on court records. But let me just briefly on this slide talk about the ones that I'm not going to talk about in detail. With our naturalizations, those are not for every single um, county, but the counties that have bound naturalization volumes, we have scanned and indexed those and put them online. Uh, they actually include um, some federal naturalizations as well. And the one tip that I would point out here is you might find that 1955 date to be kind of odd uh, because the federal government, INS, and the federal courts took over naturalizations much earlier than that. But if your naturalization was in progress in a county before that cutoff date, it would be and could be completed in the county. And so we have naturalizations that date all the way to 1955 for people who immigrated to the United States decades before, but because they filed their intent papers in that county, they had to get their naturalization there as well. So an interesting tidbit there. Uh, the coroner's inquests are phenomenal records. We don't have every county for these as well. Some have images and some do not. But if you have an ancestor that died in St. Louis, particularly under suspicious circumstances, this is a phenomenal source because they have detailed investigations of homicides, people that just died in their sleep, um, or any other suspicious circumstances. Um, they did very in a detailed investigation of those. The Civil War Provost Marshal records are important for Missouri because of the guerrilla warfare that occurred here during the Civil War. These are investigative records related to um, neighbors marauding other neighbors. In many cases, the legal actions that came out of that and investigations that came out of that. Uh, Missouri had the second most battles in the Civil War, and many of those were small conflicts. Um, at the very local level that the provost marshal records document. Um, the judicial records, I can't emphasize how important that those are. They include probate records, circuit court records, what in many states would be considered chancery court records. We only had a chancery court here for a brief period of time, and then they become part of circuit court. Uh, but those records uh, for many counties, uh, we have indexed at least up to 1900. Um, and most of those have images, or many of those have images that go with them as well. Our Supreme Court cases are very similar to those. They use the same um, judicial records database template for those, and we have them indexed through 1888 um, and actually scanned online um, through 1876, I believe. So, um, so I, I want to just introduce you to those, encourage you to go and look at those, but I'm not going to walk you through how to use those. So our primary usage, we get more than a million hits a month on our death certificates. Um, we have the Missouri um, death certificates, the official death certificates from 1910 to 1970 on our website. Uh, for those from 1956 to 1970, uh, you can actually search not only by the deceased, you can search by the spouse, the father, or the mother. Um, sometimes it doesn't list the father, mother, or spouse. So that's not a reliable search in every instance, uh, but if it's between 1956 and 1970 and you've got an aunt that disappears, you know she probably got remarried, you can actually search by her mother's name, her father's name, and sometimes find those folks even though you don't know what their name is. So it's a really good tool. We actually are using our online volunteers to continue to index those every year going backward from 56 uh, working backward once that we finish indexing, and I'll talk about that in a minute uh, for our records. Um, some other real tricks for using this, you can, it, the default is it contains a certain name, so for last name, first name, or whatever, but you can also use starts with, ends with, or even an exact search and be able to filter this at a very granular level. I actually found an error whenever I was pulling my examples for this, so my examples are people with the first name of Indiana. I thought that would be appropriate. So on this, I actually um, found a mistake. So I'm using this search strategy to show you how to, to, how to do that. So I found an Indiana whose last name started with a G, but it's actually misspelled in our database. And we'll fix that. Um, but I wanted to show you how that, that works. So I just put Indiana in as the first name and G starts with as the last name. 
You can also filter by year, which is really important if you know that an ancestor disappeared between the 18 and the 1930 and the 1940 census. You can do 1929 to 1941 and be able to only look at those, especially if you're in an urban center like St. Louis, only look at those and you can filter by the county as well. Um, instead of looking at the entire state. So some of the German names and Irish names and Scotch Irish names uh, here in our state, you're going to get lots of results in this database because there's millions of deaths um, that, are, that, are, uh, that are indexed here. So she's actually indexed as Indiana Gum. So it pulled up three Indianas whose last name started with G, and one of those is Indiana Gum. But if I click over here on View Image, it pulls up Indiana gun with two ends, and that's the mistake. So we'll need to fix this. And I'm hoping that most all of you have used death certificates and understand how important that these are. It tells you where she died. It tells you she's buried in Oaklawn Cemetery. It tells you who the uh, funeral home is, the date of the burial, the date of the death, the cause of death, what they were being treated for. Most importantly, it gives you her date of birth. And you can see that they did the math to be able to figure that out. You know her husband predeceased her um, because it says she's a widow. It shows her place of birth is Indiana. And for most of these people who are named Indiana, you'll find that as a common theme. So if you have ancestors who are named Indiana, you're probably going to find that they track back to Indiana. Her dad was born in Indiana. Her mother was born in Indiana. Um, and the informant was a William green uh, from West Plains, Missouri. Um, and I haven't done any research on this, but oftentimes you'll find that's a son-in-law, uh, a, a friend of the family, a minister or something like that. So I do want to briefly pause and talk about how that we're able to get so much online. We have an active and, and very valued volunteer uh, online volunteer program with our death certificates. You can actually go to the website on this slide. It's actually on the main pull down for the archives as well. There's a tab there for volunteers, and you can index uh, the death certificates. So January of every year, we get a new set of death certificates. It takes us about three days to scan them, and um, this is one that I indexed last night and just did a screen capture um, of it uh, so that um, I could use it as an example here. But if you've got a little time while you're watching the news or a Hallmark movie or whatever that it might be, um, you can sit and index death certificates. This is a double blind, so actually you index it and someone else indexes it, and um, so we try and eliminate as many errors as possible uh, doing this, but it's a great tool. We're already about 75% done uh, with those for 1971. As soon as that gets indexed, we add it to the database so folks can search it. So shifting away from the modern death certificates, now I want to talk a little bit uh, about the pre-1910 birth and death records. Um, so in the pre-1910 birth and death records, they were not required. Um, there were some counties and some cities that did them much, much earlier. Um, but the only time period where you consistently find them is there was a recommendation, a strong recommendation between 1883 and 1893 um, that they were to maintain birth and death records. Um, it's much more likely if they were in a city that they would be recorded. Rural, death, rural, rural deaths and rural births are less likely. Um, and the database does not include all counties. These were kept in the courthouses and some of the counties lost theirs. Um, and they didn't keep them. Um, so they are an index and a transcript only. We do not have images linked to these at this time. And then the other thing, and I've got that in bold is you wanna play with this some. So try looking at spelling errors. These are all handwritten. And so there's a lot of variation in these. And then the other big caution that I should have put on this slide and didn't is remember that children often were not named at birth. So probably 50% of these, you're going to need to be searching by the mother and father's name and in the, on the births particularly uh, because um, it does not list the child uh, on that. So if it's an uncommon name, put in the last name in search. You can filter by county, whatever it might be. So you see here that I put in Indiana Gun, and I pull up um, an Indiana Gun um, who uh, is our same lady, it looks like. It also gives her maiden name in the transcription, and I can click on that transcription um, and pull up um, that this is her son 
who was her sixth child. Um, she was born in Indiana and her husband was born in the United States. So I guess um, under the stress of having a baby, she may not have remembered what state her husband was from. It gives her name, her maiden name. And then this is a really cool, this last item here that I have um, of the arrow next to, he was the collector for Howell County. So he was an elected official. It's the 1880s. I'm thinking, go back and look at those vanity histories and see if there's a nice biography on these families there, because I would expect if there's a, if there's a history of that county that was written in the 1880s, he is going to appear and that family is going to appear um, in that. So uh, really good clue there um, for you to be able um, to use. I want to shift now to military records. Our biggest collection of military records are from the Civil War, World War I, and not in this database, but on uh, Family Search. We work with them, and they have scanned and indexed all of the ones from World War II as well. Uh, we have the Mexican War, the Spanish War, and then a whole host of local wars as well. I didn't find anyone named Indiana, but that's normally a, a woman's name. Um, so I searched by the unit name as well, just for the fun of it, and I actually came up with a few muster rolls uh, for Indiana. The second one I clicked on, he was more interested in the first. This is George Norris, who was in the 22nd Indiana. Um, he was from, or at least enlisted in New Madison, Indiana, um, and in 1862, um, he is working as a nurse in the hospital here in Jefferson City. Um, so because he had been sick before, according to this, he was on the hospital roll. And then once he got out of the hospital, they converted him over to a nurse through, it looks like the months of May and June. So here you've got an Indiana ancestor who's pops up in Jefferson City. As far as I can tell, his unit wasn't here, but he was brought here um, because uh, he was sick. Um, and then for at least a short period of time, um, he is serving in a, a hospital detail here in Missouri. So you never know what you're going to find um, whenever you're searching some of these records. All right, moving on now to the Missouri State Archives, uh, Missouri State Penitentiary records. The biggest tourist attraction in Jefferson City, oddly enough, is the Missouri State Penitentiary. It's the largest penitentiary um, in the United States for much of its history. Um, there was a Times magazine article about it being the bloodiest 40 acres um, in the United States, and that may not be untrue, um, but we have placed, um, and they're very popular, oddly enough, um, the um, registers for the Missouri State Penitentiary from 1836 to 1931 online, and we're working with our online volunteers to do additional volumes of those as well. We have the records all the way up through 1987. Unfortunately, um, the glass plate mug shots, we have a few of them before 1928, but most of the mug shots only begin in 1928. Um, so, and we've only imaged those up um, through the same time period of 1931 uh, available online. There are a lot of other uh, uh, corrections related uh, records that we have um, that you can search for, um, but uh, being able to find a mug shot of your ancestor um, Ed, that was in prison um, is kind of an interesting family story, and it will lead you to court records and to other records, uh, newspapers, and those kind of things. Um, that mugshot that I have here, look at him for a second if he looks familiar, because that's James Earl Ray. He escaped uh, from the Missouri State Penitentiary uh, before uh, being on the run for a long time um, and eventually um, killing Dr. Martin Luther King in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, while he was an escapee from uh, from the Missouri State Penitentiary. Um, so again, um, I didn't expect to find uh, anyone, and I didn't find anyone with the first name or last name of Indiana, but I did a keyword search, and I literally came up with thousands and thousands of inmates um, who were native to Indiana. Now, you have to remember that this is over the course of a long time span, uh, but uh, there's at least more than 999 um, inmates um, that were there. So I went to the very bottom of the list and pulled Lewis Zero because I thought that was a really cool last name. Um, and it gives you all kinds of information in the transcript about him. Um, I've cut and pasted. If you click on the view numerical register at the bottom, um, I've actually cut and pasted all the information um, about him here. He was about five foot five, 
um, five foot four, I guess he couldn't tell. Maybe he was five foot four and a half or something. Size 11 shoe, um, blue eyes, fair complexion, light colored hair, beard and mustache, Lutheran intemperate, which means he drank. And he re read and write. It's interesting down here. It says his parents were dead and that he was single. So it gives you all kinds of details um, that you can use. The fisherman thing, I think, is interesting, too. Um, I wondered if that was maybe up in the Great Lakes or something. But uh, anyway, and there's a lot of information that this will tell you. So, so I want to talk about our census and tax lists. Um, but I want to do that uh, by actually talking about another indexing project we have. Um, we have, over the years, taken our early uh, census records and put them online. Our territorial tax lists have been indexed and put online. We're currently working through a transcription service called From the Page, which is publicly accessible. You can go out and index this um, uh, today. Um, we're working on, we've done the 1850 slave schedules for Missouri. We're working on the 1860 slave schedules for Missouri. Um, and so this is just an example of it has an image, you type the information we asked for on the right side, and you're able, and you're able to, um, um, to help us put material, more material online uh, for you to be able to use in your research. Um, I, I did want to have a slide in here briefly to again emphasize how important that the judicial records are, uh, because um, there's just so much family information in these. Don't just think that they appear in probate records. Historically, we were just as litigious or maybe even more so than we are now. There are people spending hundreds of dollars to sue over a $2 debt. I don't understand it, but that's what they did. One last resource that's not a database that I would encourage you to go out and use as well. Um, and, and that is our county records on microfilm list. This shows you what records that we have microfilmed, and it allows you to request things or know specifically what you want to request from us um, that we have microfilmed. Many of these have also been digitized, a few by Ancestry, and almost all of them on Family Search as well. They don't use the same microfilm roll numbers as we have, but you should be able to find them as digitized uh, records on Family Search as well. Uh, over time, we will be adding those images to our website as well. Uh, but for the things that aren't in our databases, you can oftentimes, the county records, you can go to this list, go to the county, go to the office you're interested in, and look at all the different books or all the different loose records that we have microfilmed and be able uh, to request those from us or browse if you can find them on Ancestry or Family Search. So I will stop now and open up for questions but would just uh, want to emphasize um, that if you have a request, we're really easy. If you can't find it on the website, we're really easy to either email. We have a web request form that kind of funnels you uh, to specify exactly what you're requesting. Um, we're one of the cheapest places in the country to do research. We don't actually charge for the research. We only are allowed to charge for copies. Um, and so as long as you're willing to wait a couple of three weeks in the queue, um, you can request up to three things at a time uh, from us, and we'll be glad to try and help you uh, with your Missouri uh, records.